All right, hello everyone, and welcome to session six of I-13. Uh, if you're watching this, uh, chances are you're wondering why it wasn't on Twitch. Long story short there, I'm basically getting about 50% packet drop to Twitch right now, so I'm just recording locally for this session. Um, but we're just going to go ahead and jump right into things. And our sort of scene for today is that after you, the I-13's encounter with the Jovum, and the successful first contact there. You all have returned to your quote-unquote de facto job, which is to patrol the Cardassian slash Dominion border uh, in search of any, say, testing ships, uh, any crises, things of that nature. Uh, but our first scene is not actually a crisis. Well, I guess it could be. Uh, our first scene is pretty much everyone about midway through Alpha Shift on the bridge. And as you all are sitting around, you know, nothing really important going on, uh, the turbo lift door opens and an enigmatic figure steps out of it. It is none other than a certain Seagull. And I'm going to let GM Josh take it from there. As Seagull walks in again, he spreads his penetrating gaze across the the bridge. It's been asked before what race or species is Seagull, and no one can really tell. Q or human, Vulcan, some other being who can say. But he has a, a container of food, and as he walks on the bridge, he says, I got an order for Richie. Anybody seen Richie? Um... Do you even have clearance to be on the bridge? Well, let's face it. I don't believe in your authority. <laughs> Captain Tron looks around the bridge. <laughs> yeah, uh, Com Commander Holton's sort of like looking at Seagal like, Did you really just say that? I got an order here for Richie. Anybody seen Richie? Uh, and... <laughs> I can't say I have. And Centauri, who is uh, wearing a pair of thick aviator sunglasses, will uh, sort of move them down slightly on the bridge of a strange nostril or nose-like protrusion on his beak and uh, say, uh, well, what is it exactly? Got some sandwiches here. Is anybody hungry? Do they have some kind of seed in them? D it, the bread, maybe that has seeds. I'd take that. And he tosses you a sandwich. Oh. Perfectly tossed straight to your face. Uh, can I make a roll to try to catch that so it does not hit me in the face? Yeah, sure. Roll me a uh, control security difficulty of one. I'm yeah, going to Miami. laugh if you roll a complication. I was about to say exactly that. Let's do that. I'm going to say no applicable focus. Hey, two successes. You get a momentum. Yeah, you catch it. No problem. Oh, sweet. Sunflower seeds. Oh, that, that is great. And uh, he will shoot a pair of long feathery finger guns in Seagal's direction. Hey, thanks. He'll just start eating the sandwich. And Seagull just gives you one of those upward nods. And he walks over to you, Shron, and he opens the container. You can see a bunch of sandwiches, and he looks at you expectantly. Um. No, no thanks. I, I just ate. I'm, I'm okay. Now, how do you want to do this? You want to play this game all the way? I'll have 300 agents come up here to this little Hick starship and feed every orifice you got. When it's over, you can go to your favorite replicator and get a nice soothing ointment. Well, how do you want it, huh? Hold, like, holds up a hand like, sir, should I? I don't know. Escort him off the bridge? Uh, Mr. Stegall, um... We're actually getting a priority message from Starfleet here, so uh, you're going to have to leave the bridge. It's only a uh, bridge, bridge crew only, so you'll have to uh, excuse us. All right, when you're ready, though, I'll be here. 
as he walks out, if he's departing at this moment, uh, Tori is going to shoot him another finger gun and uh, he'll say, hey, uh, thanks a lot there, Seagull. You're a great guy. And he stops as, going, as he's going out the door and he turns to you and just gives you one wink and walks out. And hey. as, uh, as Seagull goes into the turbo lift, Holton just looks across everyone and just says, so... I didn't just hallucinate that, right? Uh, Commander, I had, I had to approve every personnel placement on this ship, and I don't remember seeing him. One moment, sir. And she taps on her console. No, no, sir. You appear to... I see a, an order here. You stamped on it. There is a seagull that is supposed to be on our ship. Captain Sean brings up a data pad, hits a few buttons to pull up his personnel file, and sees, looks around, says he's a loose cannon. We're going to have to watch out for this uh, seagull. Uh, Captain, could I ask a question about his, uh, his records? Um, Go ahead. Well... Sir, does he have any Aurelian in his background? I mean, I can't, I can't quite place his race. To be honest, it doesn't say anything specific here either. Uh, well, it's like seagull. It just make, it makes perfect sense. And Holton just sort of scratches her head as she keeps looking at the personnel file. Y you all know Boothby back at the academy, yeah. Oh, of course. Well, you know, the whole joke about Boothby just sort of always being there at Starfleet HQ. Like, he literally has been there for hundreds and hundreds of years just tending the grounds. Yeah. I don't know. I get that vibe when I look at this, when I look at Seagull's record. Just that this is... He has been a cook for a very long time. So what you're saying there, Commander, is that it's like this, one of those things that mankind was not meant to know sort of things. That or we have a strange version of Guinan from uh, the Enterprise D, that's for sure. Captain, I looked on his record and it says gender. Beside it says every. That's confusing. We might want to assign a security team just to watch him. Is anybody else worried about the fact that he was able to get up here without us calling him in or anything? Yes, I do think that is a cause for concern. Uh, Mr. Saval, could you check and see how he managed that? Oh, um, and Saval will straighten up. Uh, you notice that he seems quite uh, nonplussed by the appearance of Seagal, almost as if, he's, as if he's been shaken by the man's very presence. Mm. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, I, I do apologize, Commander. I, I had thought that the security lockouts on the bridge would have precluded entry by any unauthorized personnel. I will investigate this matter at uh, my earliest opportunity. Could I actually run some kind of security check to see how he was able to access the bridge? Yeah, and in fact, as you start to tap on your console to bring that up, uh, what happens is that there's a violent rock of the ship, and immediately red alert uh, is sort of called. So the, the lights dim, begin blaring red, and I would like Ensign Tari to roll me a daring and a con at a difficulty of three assisted by the ship's engines and con. Okay, I'll uh, buy an extra die using that point of momentum. Okay. And this is an activation for Tari, so you could upgrade him in some way. Um, I think in the future I would take the aerial combat uh, focus for the Aurelian, but, uh, or talent for the Aurelian, but we'll handle that later. Okay. Ooh, interesting. So here's what's going to happen. Uh, Tari, 
The reason the ship has gone to red alert and the reason for the violent shaking is that you quite literally almost flew into a rogue planet. Uh, sort of to, for those who aren't familiar with the term, uh, a rogue planet is something that results when uh, a planet sort of gets shot out of its solar system and just sort of goes on its own little journey through the universe. Um, they're very rare, uh, but this would be sort of the problem with rogue planets is that until you're right on top of them, you tend to miss them very easily. Um, what I'm going to say is I'm going to take threat for the uh, success at a cost, but there is a complication on the field. So what happens is, Tari, you are able to steer the I-13 away before you start, you know, like going into the atmosphere of this rogue planet. But in the process... Uh, you end up actually pulling uh, the structure of the ship a little too hard. And I would like you all to take one structure breach, and I will roll to see if anyone has been critically injured. The good news is that despite the rocks and the sparks, uh, everyone is fine. No casualties reported. And you are currently in the clear. Ensign, report. What was that? That, that planet just came out of nowhere. It was it's entirely his fault, Captain. It's not mine. You saw him cut me off. You're, you're blaming the chef? Uh, b blaming the planet. It's It just came out of nowhere. I... Okay. Um, also, yes, I am blaming the chef because he gave me such a delicious sandwich. I was distracted by that. So it, it's also Commander Saval's fault because... He, his security programs failed, and he, he let the chef on the bridge. So that's that's enough, Ensign. Uh, Commander Telek, are we, uh, we did we suffer any damage there? Unfortunately, it looks like there is some damage to the ship, um, but it doesn't look like there are any casualties. So that's good, at least. Okay. Um... Let's scan this planet and see see where it came from. And this is an opportunity. Rogue planets are fairly rare. Maybe we can do some science. We can do some research while we're out here. And I believe that means, Mr. Idru, we now have a task for you. Uh, Idru, I'd like you to roll me a reason and a science. The ship will assist you with a sensor's science. The difficulty was going to be a 2, but you're a Nova class with advanced sensor suites, so that becomes a difficulty of 1. Okay. Reason science, you said there, right? Correct. Uh, sensor operations focus? Most definitely. I'm just going to do a straight roll. Okay. All right, two successes. Let's see if the ship gets you any more. Again, that is uh, sensor science on the ship, whoever has that. Oh, I... that. Hey, look at that. Bunch of successes. So yeah, that's uh, three successes, which means you get two momentum. And I actually have a little handout prepared for this. Uh, you should now see, GM Josh, you should be able to see uh, a Rogue Planet Scans handout. Well, Captain, first of all, it's a Class L, well, ball of rock, really. Rock and ice. Also, from what I can tell, looks like there's a facility near the equator. That seems strange. The facility itself is quite interesting. It's maintaining a Class L environment, so much like the rest of the planet. I'm actually getting some life signs down there, if you can believe it. Although, uh, maybe it's my sensors or the game of Animal Crossing I just lost with this power fluctuation, but... The uh, readings show that one of the life signs might be dead, or they might be alive. There's no way to figure it out until we check. 
Uh, sorry, Doc. Uh, it, it, what do you mean it might be alive or it might be dead? I, I thought you could tell whether someone's alive or dead fairly easily. Under normal circumstances, that's correct. The two faint life signs that are in the facility, at least, well, okay, they're both going back and forth between alive or being dead. Now, it could just be the sensors can't map their life signs to anything we know, and this is an anomaly, or they could be in some kind of distress. Huh. And then Idri hits a few keys on his panel. And, well, I thought you might also find this interesting, Captain. The planet is on a course for Dominion space. It looks like in three days they will be in their territory. Any idea of the source of the structure, the who could have built it, is it familiar at all? What I would say is that, Idru, you do technically have a free question. I could answer that for you. Yeah, let's go for that. Have I seen a, a facility like this before? The answer to that is after comparing with Starfleet's records, uh, no, actually, this is an alien design, one that has not been encountered before. Um, you are seeing some of the common trappings of Starfleet, or not Starfleet, but spacefaring species. Um, I believe, what is it, Duranium? That is the sort of catch-all that everybody uses for their uh, sort of construction. Um, but again, it's done in such a way that would suggest that this is something new. Well, there you have it, Captain. That's not anything I've seen before, but they're definitely advanced. Commander Saval, do you pick up any ships nearby? Maybe warp signatures that have come and gone? Uh, could I make a scan for that, or...? You certainly may. That would be a reason security. The ship will assist you with a sensor security. The difficulty overall will be a one. All right, I'll just uh, roll the two dice then. Uh, applicable focus, or...? You would have one, yeah. Unfortunately, no help from the ship. But you don't need it. You get three successes. So that's what? Another two momentum. Very nice. I would say that there isn't any sort of sign that the planet has been visited by a warp-capable ship. But you are detecting that on the projected path of this rogue planet, uh, as soon as it hits Dominion space, it's actually going to go by one of the Dominion patrol groups. Captain, I'm not detecting any vessels near the planet or on the planet's surface, insofar as I can tell. However, uh, once the planetoid enters Dominion space, it is likely to encounter Dominion patrols. If I may, I would recommend that we investigate the facility on the surface to make certain that there are no assets that could fall into Dominion hands. Commander, could you please plot the course that this planet has been on? Just as a curiosity for me. I would say, actually, that might be a uh, an Encentari thing, because they are your, your con officer. Um, sure. <laughs> hey, don't, uh, don't try to steal my job there, Commander. And he points the finger gun over at Saval. Uh, sure thing, Captain. Hello. So, let's see, reason... Let's... I'm thinking, yeah, either reason or control plus con. Let's do a reason con on this one. Uh, if and you have astro navigation, astro charting, uh, basically anything related to astral navigation, that would apply here. Uh, let's have the computer ha or the ship assist you with a computers and con. Uh, I will make this a difficulty of two. Okay. Um, I will buy one extra die, so I'm rolling 3d20. Okay. And I don't have an applicable focus. Well, you get three successes, which is already more than you need. So let's, uh, let's see a computer's con from the ship, and then we're good to go. All right. A, uh, that's a total of four successes, <laughs> so you get two momentum. So, Tari, what you're seeing is that if you were to trace this planet back... It's actually one of the planets that was initially in the Badlands, uh, somewhere on the order to the order of magnitude of, uh, if I have my my scale right, uh, 
about a few thousand years ago, uh, at least 40 or 50 millennia. So it's been on a journey for a while. Well, uh, Captain, I've extrapolated its course. Looks like it came from, well, where we had our first mission, back in the Badlands. Okay, let's, uh, we have roughly three days until this rogue planet's on the other side of the border, so let's take our chance now and let's look at this facility and, and see if those people down there actually need our help. Uh, Commander Holton, I'll have you take charge of the putting together the away team. Uh, not to, uh, say no to that, sir, but at least what I'm seeing on these scans, you might be a better fit for this one. How so? Well, uh, it is a Class L environment, and the reason it's rated Class L is that it's extremely cold. Uh, not to be, uh, speciesist, sir, but you are an Endorian. So you're, as the first officer, you're saying the captain should be on the away mission. <laughs> she actually smiles a little bit too widely at that and says, I thought I'd give you the opportunity for once. Why not? Uh, Commander Saval, Commander Talek, Lieutenant Commander Idru. Let's, uh, let's go exploring. All right, and as I get everyone's tokens situate, si ah, situated, that's a word, uh, are you guys bringing any special equipment? Now, as a reminder, uh, Tolek, as chief engineer, does get a engineering tricorder for free. Uh, Idru, uh, I would say you get a medical kit for free. Um, it is a Class L environment, meaning that as long as you take something like a Triox injection... Um, you are fine, and a Trax injection won't really cost anything momentum-wise. But if you want to take EV suits or additional power cells or anything like that, now would be the time to tell me. I think Saval would want to disseminate Type 3 phaser rifles. Okay. He'd certainly take one for himself. If I remember correctly, as I try to bring up the chart, uh, that is, I believe, two momentum and a threat? Let's double check because that could matter. I was under the impression it was one and one, but it might be one and one. That's why we're gonna look it up just to be extra, extra sure. And Idri gives Saval a look as if to say, "Come on, you know I'm not taking this." Uh, Doctor, I wouldn't be comfortable if you tried to use one e either way. So I, I agree with your re reluctance. Oh, interesting. So it's actually Momentum 1 and 2 Threat. So if you want to pay that, yeah, we can do that. Now, Commander, I've only detected two life signs down there. We're not occupying the planet. You've also noted that they are in some form of flux. The life sign readings are uncertain. I don't trust your scans. Commander. We are also fairly close to the Dominion border. Who knows what could have happened while we're down on that planet. And we know from our encounter with the Dominion in the Badlands that, uh, and the Ferengi freighters that the Dominion is now in possession of at least some cloaking devices. Very well. We'll do it your way. As I'm scrolling but I don't think Idru's the... going to take anything. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was going to say, I don't think Idru's taking anything more than just his standard um, medical kit with a tr medical tricorder. All right. Uh, I'm just scrolling through, seeing if there's any other bits of equipment you might want to take. It's a breathable atmosphere. It is, but it's extremely cold. Like, I would say, think uh, Antarctica level temperatures. You can survive so it, but it's not going to be fun. We're not as cold as. Yeah, not as cold as Rurupente. Uh, 
Actually, if I remember correctly, Ruapenthe and Antarctica are about the same temperatures. I don't know. Uh, let's just, let me put it this way. If you go in your standard Starfleet uniform, you maybe are going to start getting frostbite within 10, 15 minutes. No, I think it's worth the two momentum to have the EV suits. Okay. And just in case it becomes relevant, uh, just remember that while in an EV suit, you have a resistance of one. Let's see if there's anything else you so might want to How much are we spending total? Uh, I believe three. Uh, one for the Type 3, and then two for the environmental suits. That's what I thought. Um, but also looking at this list, uh, would you be taking anything like, say, a Pattern Enhancer... Or perhaps a spare power cell, uh, anything of that nature. I was actually going to recommend that we take the aero shuttle down rather than transporting, but okay. I mean, that is an option. Did we ever? That's kind of what I was thinking too. Did we ever give the shuttle a name? No, I don't think you've named the Wave Rider yet. Wave Rider is pretty cool on its own, but I was just wondering. That's why I thought we had named it, because it already had a cool name. <laughs> well, let's, uh, yeah, let's just say it. We'll, we'll call it the Wave Rider for now, because it, it is kind of cool. So, Talek, uh, Saval, Idru, Shran, you all suit up in your EV suits, and as a reminder to get down to the Wave Rider, there's sort of a a hatch in the back of the bridge that you open up and clamber down a long ladder. Uh, it takes you right into the Wave Rider from the top. And as you seal the hatch behind you and begin your pre-flight checks, uh, I do have to ask, who is sitting at the helm? Oh, I think it's me. Okay. So, Shran, I need you to roll me a control and a con, please. The difficulty on this would be a two. Now, the reason for that is because, well, let's just say that uh, the structural damage that was done to the I-13 earlier, if you don't disengage properly, it might be, shall we say, hazardous to the rest of the ship. Okay, uh, does my focus in helm operations apply? Most definitely it would. Um, I'll burn a dice. Okay. And you said control con? Correct. Uh... Sorry, I'm just going over my talents. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, no, I'll just roll. Uh, control. Oh, it's not bringing up. Thing. There we go. Control con. Now that is interesting because you do succeed, but there is a complication. I think this is funny, so this is how we'll do it. You managed to get the wave rider about halfway out from underneath the saucer section when all of a sudden there's a sort of a, a, a jolt to the left as one of the wings of the Wave Rider catches on something. And before you can really sort of oversteer and correct, there's this really loud scraping sound of metal on metal. And the Wave Rider does eventually get away from the I-13, but looking back, uh, you have carved a good meter-deep gash in the underside of the saucer section. So you are going to take another breach to structure on the I-13, but the good news is, again, you didn't kill anybody or maim anybody in the process. Captain, if I may, well, I don't intend to disrespect your piloting abilities, perhaps the next time that we embark on the uh, Wave Rider, Ensign Torre should accompany us. Captain, maybe you should have taken one of those sandwiches. I said I was not hungry. Um... Commander, can you please get an engineering team to, uh, Commander Talek, get an engineering team to start, uh, assessing that damage? And little does the captain know I'm already on top of that, but 
Telec does not look happy about that additional damage to the. I think few people would be excited with that sort of thing. And I actually forgot we have a Wave Rider map, so there we go. I think we've decided to name the Wave Rider the Bodie. The Bodie? Bodie McBoatface? Well, no, the, the Bodie from Patrick Swayze's uh, character in Point Break. Oh, that Bodie! I gotcha. It's beautiful. I'm on board. All right. Well, the good news, at least as far as the captain is concerned, is that the rest of your journey down to this rogue planet and through the atmosphere, uh, fairly sedate. Um, there's a little bit of bumping and grinding as the ship sort of jostles as it hits the atmosphere. But once you get past the upper cloud layer and begin soaring underneath, uh, what you find is that the ride smooths out. Now... Again, as a rogue planet, it doesn't really get a whole lot of sunlight, meaning that the world is cast in an umbral darkness. However, what's really striking you all sort of maybe in amazement is that you are seeing out of the front view screen that the planet itself is bathed in a almost an ultraviolet purplish light. Um that gives the features of the planet, the mountain ranges, the plains of ice. Uh, it, it's it's almost like a, a Twitter, a twinkling diamond, if you will. Um, but what, what is really interesting is the fact that every so often, maybe about uh, every two or three uh, kilometers away or kilometers away from one another, there are these massive floating islands of crystal that seem to be suspended from a magnetic sort of repelling force that is just enough to keep them levitating, but not enough to like send them flying up into space, if that makes any sense. And how long, how large are they? Uh, I would say they range in uh, size from, I would say maybe about the size of a school bus all the way up to maybe about the size of Rhode Island. So they get huge. Yeah, I was going to suggest maybe capturing one for science uh, to, to study, but uh, that's way too big. Um, but I think I'll, I'll ask uh, Commander Drew as I pilot the ship down to uh, to, to do some scans on them and, and see, because that, that's a unique feature, and I think it's definitely something I'd want to include in our report. Drew, I'd like you to roll me a uh, Reason Science. Difficulty on this is one, and uh, the Bodhi will assist you with a sensor science. So could I uh, push you a little bit and say, since I'm scanning the planet again, uh -huh. since I've already scanned it previously, that my testing a theory and theory into practice talents would come into play since I've already done this with a science roll. Yeah, I'd allow it. Does that lower the difficulty to a zero, get me an extra d20, and yeah, all those things. It's a good combo of uh, talents you got going there. All right, so no help from the Bodhi. Bodhi had a total of seven for that, so that was a... Uh... Wow, okay. Okay. just one success. So I will give you the option. You can... Oh, it's a difficulty zero, so you do just get the one momentum. Um, so Idru, again, you do have a free question to ask after this, but... When you scan one of these floating islands, what you notice is that the core of these islands is very similar to that of, say, uh, let's use earthen as an example. Um, you know how the center of the earth is molten iron that spins very quickly, and that's how you get a magnetic field? I would say that's sort of the same thing here, just on a smaller scale where the islands all have this sort of molten magnetic core that is repulsing them away from the actual planet's core. So for a question, I was thinking, could we tell what they're made of? Uh, they are made out of, uh, if I have, I'm trying to see where are my notes because I did write this down. Uh, yes, they are made out of a nickel-iron composite. 
Okay, so pretty standard stuff, nothing too fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely not, like, say, unobtainium or anything like that. Well, Captain, it seems to be a natural phenomenon that at least is making these per, uh, formations float or hover before us. They're not made out of anything that's completely unusual. I would say at first glance, they're probably just an interesting oddity of this planet. Fascinating. Hopefully we'll have a chance to study them further. And as the... Uh, the... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, indeed, this entire planet is a bit of a mystery. Uh, rogue planets in general are, are quite rare. Unfortunately, we're on a bit of a timeline here. So, uh, as you all steer just maybe a little bit faster after realizing that, yeah, you're on a time crunch, uh, you eventually come to the location of the facility. And it's interesting because the facility isn't on the ground like initial scans show. It is actually on a fairly sizable chunk that is floating about uh, 250 meters off of the ground. So it's close to the ground, but it is, again, one of those floating islands. Uh, the facility itself looks to be like it just is a tube that sort of comes up out of the ground, and there's like a little landing platform, or at least a flat area, before where the tube goes into the Earth. And uh, the tube itself is sealed by two large doors, that have hinges on the exterior. Uh, there is alien script that is written on these doors, but the Universal Translator is unable to pierce them and figure out what language it is. And we're, we're able to, uh, there's, there's space to land? Yeah, I would say that without needing a roll, you can set her down right outside. And as you do, uh, I would say that something interesting happens in that uh, as you all are maybe, you know, getting your EV suits ready, doing your double uh, double checks on your seals, there's a sudden thud at the front of the ship. And when you look outside on literally attached to the uh, Bodhi's front sort of, uh, what is it called? The front window. Um, there is what looks to be an octopus-like creature. Uh, so you're seeing sort of the underside of the creature. So you're seeing a beak, many suction cup tentacles, and a bulbous body that goes beyond it. Um, it is of a white color that has almost a bioluminescent orange speckled throughout. Well, I will immediately have my tricorder out, tricorder out trying to scan it. Okay. And I will have my phaser rifle at the ready. Okay. Andrew, I'd like you to roll me a reason medicine, please. Difficulty of one. And if you have xenobiology, most definitely would apply here. Yeah, I do. One success is all you need. So, you don't have to worry about the creature breaking into the shuttle or anything, uh, but what's really interesting to you is that, remember how I said that the core of these floating islands is some sort of nickel-iron composite? Interestingly, same thing going on with the octopus, and in fact, as you watch, the octopus detaches from the front and literally begins sort of floating away like a jellyfish pulsating its tentacles as it flies off into the darkness. So is it artificial or is it organic? No, it's entirely organic. Forgive me, Doctor, but I didn't believe that that was biologically possible. Uh, I'm as much of a loss myself. It's uh, not something you see very commonly. Could I troubleshoot our sensors? You certainly can. Roll me a, let's do an insight engineering difficulty of zero.
Well, you nope. still pass. Uh, yeah, your sentences are working fine, actually. Well, I can verify that it's not the ship itself that's doing this. It's just something very unusual that we've encountered. Did it show up as a life form? Interestingly, it did not. Well, Captain, this could lead me to believe that our initial scan might have grossly misunderstood the amount of life forms on this planet. If this creature did not show up on our scan at all, there could be lots more. That doesn't mean that they're hostile. I look over to Saval, so no need to be alarmed. But there could be more beings than we thought. Well, Doctor, if your predictions regarding their hostility are as accurate as your initial sensor scans, I believe that it was wise of us to take our Type 3 phaser rifles with us. Ah, uh, thank you, Mr. Saval. That's why I always have you along. <laughs> is there a... Is there any, uh, history of rogue planets having naturally occurring life forms on them? Actually, yes. Uh, even in the Star Trek universe, there is precedent for uh, certain planets to have atmosphere, to have life. In fact, I think that might have been an episode of Voyager, even, um, where they encounter like a dark jungle planet, and one of them gets stuck there. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember that now. Uh huh. And there's the hunt. There's the hunting party. Uh huh. And that is definitely. Oh no, that's not Voyager. That's um Enterprise. Oh, was that Enterprise? There you go. I knew it was we one of the shows. Of two, we might be thinking of two different episodes that have similar plots. <laughs> Either that way, would be surprising. Yeah, I was going to say, either way, it's not unheard of, but again, it is a rarity. Okay, perfect. Uh, Dr. Idru, would you care to capture one of these creatures for study? To be honest, Commander, that's not something I'm very interested in. I think it's best to leave them and leave them in their natural environment now certainly if we have three days to study them i'd like to spend as much of that time as possible but i'd like to leave them in their home now if there's someone here that needs our help of course that changes things and actually as you all are discussing this uh, maybe one of you looks out of the window again, and you notice that the silo doors, quote-unquote, have opened. You never heard anything. You just sort of looked away one moment, and then you look back, and the silo doors are open. And you see a tunnel that leads deep into the, uh, the earth. If I had to give a uh, pop culture comparison, uh, think sort of like Mass Effect 1, where you have those uh, tube things that go into the... Uh, the I'm trying to remember the specific moon, um, but it's a fairly common thing in Mass Effect One where it just sort of goes into the planet itself. And is this aperture sufficiently large to take the shuttle in, or is it just human sized? Uh, interestingly, you could potentially take the Wave Rider in, but you would have only about an inch clearance on either side. Um, so it's not quite Wave Rider sized, but it's also much larger than normal humanoid would be. Captain, might you permit me to pilot the shuttle? I don't want to risk taking it in there. Very well, Captain. Uh, are there lights in the in the facility? There are, yes. And as you look, they sort of come to life like uh, douche, 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 douche as spotlights begin to illuminate the corridor for you. Maybe they're rolling out the welcome mat. And perhaps the creature we saw before was the welcome party. Just saying hello. Maybe. I would submit that both of those are overly optimistic assumptions, Captain, but... Well, let's suit up and head out. 
Alrighty. So, uh, as you all get out of the Wave Rider and uh, begin heading for the uh, tube into the Earth, uh, I would like everyone to roll me a fitness and a security, please. Difficulty of one. I'm in so much trouble. <laughs> um, would a focus in survival apply? It most definitely would. All right, so nothing for Telek. Two for Saval. Uh, Shran is apparently perfect for this. And a success from Idru. So I believe that's three momentum overall. Uh, but I would say if you give me two momentum, we can count Telek as a success as well. I, I say yeah. Okay. So just the one momentum gain then. I believe you're at two. So... As you uh, step out of the Wave Rider and begin trudging towards this uh, welcome mat, as it were, um, what happens is the wind suddenly picks up and the wind is almost threatening to knock you off of your feet. Uh, some of you manage to get your mag boots activated in time, uh, but one of you does end up having to catch Commander Tolek before they are literally blown off of the rock. That's how violent the winds are. Um, but the good news is that once the mag boots are activated, you're just trudging through a, a windstorm, basically. And when you reach the uh, silo doors and start passing into the tube, the wind just becomes a, a noise in the background. And as you descend deeper and deeper and deeper, I can now put you on this map. So again, there is a common theme here that the sort of structure itself is otherwise designed for creatures that are much larger than you. Um, interestingly, there is uh, a almost a fusion between metal walling and uh, other sorts of earthen sculpturing that is mixed in with the ice and the surrounding environment. Um, but as you all are proceeding further and further into the structure, uh, Saval, as our security officer, I need you to roll me a insight and a security, please. Uh, difficulty of two. All right. Uh, I will spend one momentum to buy a third die. Okay. So insight and security. Would my infiltration focus apply? It most definitely would. Two successes. That's all you need. You're being watched. You can't really figure out where, but you are damn sure you're being watched. Over the comms, I'll uh, secure it and send a message over to the captain. Captain, I believe that we are being observed. I am unable to identify the location of our observers, but I am quite confident that our motion is being tracked. Elish, the map has stairs. Do we see stairs going in any direction, or is the ground flat? Uh, so that's sort of, if I were to explain what you're seeing on the map better, those stairs are actually the uh, the tube you come down. So you're actually coming down the tube and coming to a flat surface, a flat sort of flooring that opens up into almost like an amphitheater, if you will. So you're coming or down into an open space. Where I was going with that was I think Idri would try to determine if there were steps, then that means it's a bipedal or a creature with, you know, feet. We've seen only one creature and then it was flying before, so I was just trying to determine if it's a, you know, ground moving creature or if it's got flight somehow. Uh I would say it's probably not a uh centaur species. It it's probably humanoid. I don't know, a centaur species can handle stairs, as we know. It's a great mystery. We should find out sometime. So just like Saval did, I'd like to um, let everyone else know uh, what's going on over the, the little comm units in our suits mm -hmm. um, and ask Idru if he can scan the area to determine the direction that these life forms may be in. 
will I make a, a bit of a show of scanning the walls with my uh, my tricorder? And Idru kind of snaps out. He was obviously looking around, just fixated in where he is. Uh, yes, Captain, and pulls out his tricorder. Okay. Well, I have good news for you. The good news is that one of the life signs is actually approaching you. The bad news, you don't have time to hide. You're not seeing anywhere you could hide. Captain, the life form is approaching. However, I would like us to consider caution before alarm. There's no place to prepare for their arrival, but there has also been no evidence of any kind of aggression. And I say that towards Saval. Uh, Saval will simply lower his phaser rifle so that it's at uh, it's not at the ready. Yes, let's let's uh, let's be friendly. Okay. So and Thrawn has, has, hasn't even taken the rifle off his back, although he he kind of has a hand towards his uh, hand phaser on his hip. Noted. So you don't have to wait long. Uh, you actually hear the approaching footfalls before you see them. And it is a very loud sort of boot on metal sort of footsteps. Very slow, very methodic. And as they get closer and they finally sort of come around a corner and you can see them for the first time. Uh, what you see is a humanoid. So, you know, two arms, two legs, a head, etc. Um, but they are encased in a black, bulbous bodysuit. Not unlike your own EV suits. Uh, but the helmet of his, uh, at least you think it's a him, uh, the helmet of his is translucent all the way around. And his face looks, again, humanish. Uh, but what's really catching your attention is his eyes are not the eyes you were expecting. They are almost like implant eyes. Um, that would suggest that his sight was replaced at some point. Um, he is also much larger than you. Uh, if I were to borrow D&D terms for a moment, if you all are medium creatures, he is a large creature. Um, so he maybe stands a good two or three heads above all of you. Um, but he doesn't appear to have any weapons at the ready, and he simply sort of you know, stops a, a respectable distance away. And in a uh, very low, almost somber voice, uh, this individual says, Hello. I was not expecting any visitors. Uh, who might you be? I am Captain uh, Oshrev Shran of the USS R-13, representing the United Federation of Planets. Um, we were unsure with our scans of this planet if there were people in danger. Do you require any assistance? Sean, I'd like you to roll me a insight and a con here. Do you have people reading as a focus? No. Do you have anything that would involve body language as a focus? No. Okay then this will be a difficulty of two. I will, uh... The odds on this are pretty long, but I'll buy... I'll use the momentum to buy an extra dice. Okay. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to take the oh, fourth threat for that one. Uh, so yeah, Shran, you don't really notice anything body language wise from this individual, uh, but they do sort of reply again in a very somber, morose tone. Ah, I cannot say I've heard of you or your species. And he sort of looks at the other three. They do not seem to be the same species as you. Are you a conglomerate? Um, uh, we're... A federation, a group of like-minded species that work together for the betterment of us all. Ah. I remember when my species was like that. And is there a word for your species? Uh, 
trust me when I say it does not matter. The only ones of us left are myself and my wife. Is this your homeworld? What remains of it? And Idris steps know. forward. Forgive me, Captain, right. but... I, I didn't know whether I, I was thinking, like, do I say sorry? I don't... I'm confused. But Idris steps Personally, forward. Me. He says, forgive me, Captain. Uh, sir, and it addresses the alien, our scans detected that there might be a you or your wife, as you mentioned, may be injured. Do you require any kind of medical assistance? And I would say without needing a roll here, you know, let's make it a roll just because I think it's important because you have no momentum. Uh, Idra, roll me another insight con, but the difficulty is a zero. Focus maybe in emergency medicine, xenobiology, or anthropology? I'll give you anthropology. Oh boy, because my con is is not is not very good. Hey, you get two successes. That's two momentum. The alien's face definitely becomes a bit more tense, like lines appear on his face, almost as if he is uh, talking about something that maybe is a very sore subject. But he does answer. Ah, yes, my wife. Uh, as I said, we are the only two left. And she is in great peril. One of our party is a doctor. Might we be able to assist you? Uh, given your permission, of course, Captain. Yes. And he does perk up a little bit, but not a whole lot. And he says, another doctor might have the answer to a problem that I have not been able to find in 300 years. Oh, I can't promise anything in that amount of time, but I'd certainly like to give it a try with your permission. Where are my manners? I am... Rocktiv, Dr. Rocktiv. Uh, I know you introduced yourself, Captain, but uh, who are your uh, officers? And uh, I motion to them as I say their names. This is Commander Talek, Commander Saval, and Lieutenant Commander Eder, who is the uh, aforementioned doctor. Mm. I see... Mr. Idru and I share a fondness for shaved head. And Idru laughs. Well, in my case, Mr. Rocktiv, my it's a, a species a trait, not necessarily a choice. Mm. Mine is also by necessity, but come, I will show you the problem I am dealing with. And he turns very slowly and begins trudging down the corridor. Doesn't really you know, check to see if you're following him. Uh, so if you wanted to linger for a little bit to have a side conversation, this would be the chance. Idris probably going to charge off behind him, so you'd have to stop him if you wanted to talk to him. Uh, I would like to speak with Commander Talek, and, and uh, I would say, uh, Commander, I would like you to take detailed scans of the environmental suit that Rocktiv is wearing. I sense that it may be more advanced than ours, and it may be concealing some form of weaponry. Understood. I will see what I can tell from it. Are you... What makes you think it might contain weaponry? It seems like they're alone here on this planet. I found that it is often wise to take necessary precautions. If there's any chance that he is armed, I would like to be aware of it. I'll see what I can find out. Thank you, Commander. I would like to go...
Uh oh. We'd like I think for you to go also. Out. But come back. You would like to just go. <laughs> <laughs> Well, as he's getting that sorted out, let's do that roll for Talek. So, Talek, if you want to roll me a uh, reason engineering difficulty of two. On a scale of zero to two, how important is this? I mean, that's entirely up I'm to you. I'm asking the other guys, not you. Sorry. <laughs> I would say it's a, a one, perhaps. As in one momentum. That's what I was going for. Mm -hmm. Oh, that is uh, three successes. So you get some momentum right back. And uh, yeah, Telek, now that you've actually scanned uh, Rocktiv's uh, suit... There are indeed uh, hidden weaponry inside. Um, it's almost like a, uh, a Type 1 phaser, if you will, that can be concealed. Um, but interestingly, it doesn't appear to fire uh, a energy weapon, at least not the way a phaser does. If anything, it seems to fire a subnucleonic beam that lowers whatever it hits, lowers the ambient temperature and the temperature of the object. It's a freeze gun. I'll relay that information to Commander Saval. Oh, and... you! <laughs> it took Tron what? this long to get it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Commander okay. Saval to Captain Shran. You should know oh, that our that. host is armed. He has a concealed freezing weapon of some kind, a subnucleonic beam capable of lowering the ambient temperature of any object that it strikes. Ah. Uh. Good to know. Um, sorry, I because I cut out there for a second. Did you hear me saying that I wanted to go ahead with the doctor? Uh, we got about the go ahead, and then it was just like nothing. So okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to do is just check with the, with my tricorder and make sure I still had contact with the wave rider. You do actually, yeah. You get a okay. clear communication signal back to the wave rider. Just wanted to make sure we were still in contact with it. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Commander Saval. Uh, I will make sure uh, to be careful. And as uh, as you all proceed in Rocktiv's wake, uh, you are eventually brought to what is essentially a uh, a large square space, not unlike a cargo hold, without anything in it. Uh, but there is one thing in it. Uh, it is a cryopod by the looks of it, or at least a casket with a transparent hood. And there are four to six tanks on either side of this casket. Uh, the casket is inclined at a 45 degree angle, and then underneath that angle is where these cylinders are. Uh, the cylinders are filled with an aquamarine liquid that glows, and you see and hear that every so often a bit of liquid is injected into the casket. Now, as for what's in the casket, because it is a transparent front, you see a female, uh, at least it appears to be female, uh, version of Rocktiv species. So again, very large, uh, disproportionately sort of white skin, um, almost to the point that it's translucent. Um, and they appear to be either in cryostasis or something of the same nature. And uh, Rocktiv brings you up to you up to them and says, "Well, this is uh, this is why I've not abandoned this place. Uh, this is my wife, Oran. I was hoping to free her one day, but it has all been for naught so far." Mr. Rocktiv, what can you tell me about her condition? It is a rare disease, a rare, for lack of a better term, uh, it's a plague, the same plague that wiped out the rest of my kind. She's all I have left. 
Do you have any records that you could share about her treatment? I have some, yes, but most of my attention has been keeping her safe. Uh, cryogenically freezing her like this has only slowed the disease. It has not stopped it completely. Sorry to interrupt, but how long has your wife been in there? About the same time that the plague started, which I suppose would put it roughly 500 years ago. Are or were all members of your species so incredibly long lived? No. I am unique in that regard, unfortunately. Well, Mr. Ruktiv, the first step in any treatment is the obtaining of as much information as possible. So you mentioned the plague started 500 years ago. Was your planet in proximity of any other astrological body or any visitors? In short, what changed in the situation on this planet to create the plague? I do not know. I have searched for that very same answer for many centuries. Uh, we were, at one point, we were a planet that was contained within a large area of space that was like a plasma storm. Uh, I have records from that time, albeit brief. But apparently when we left that area of space, uh, something changed with the biological beings on this planet they became more hostile more deadly and for lack of a better term i think that whatever afflicted my kind was evolution in the works in in what way well we didn't exactly get a whole lot of alien visitors before all this, but we ran all the same battery of tests that we did when we encountered aliens for the first time, and it was definitely not an external factor that brought the disease here. We were able to tell that the disease came from uh, a mutation in the gene, Well, fortunately, we have technology to repair genetic damage. So if you don't mind, I'd like to start with a scan of yourself to create a baseline and then scan your wife with your permission. Go ahead. And yeah, uh, to scan Rocktiv, it's a reason medicine difficulty of one. To scan his wife, it would be a difficulty of two. I think I'll I would start like with... to do a little bit of snooping i guess just like looking at the machine and see if i can figure out how it's working okay or not uh yours like, would be powering it yours would be a insight engineering difficulty of two i figure it Good. won't hurt well maybe it will hurt nobody knows I'll, of course, let her roll, but uh, I was going to say, while she's doing that, noting what she's doing, I would try to distract Rockdiv with a few questions that I'll pose in a second. Okay. All right, so interestingly, all right, so we have two successes from Tolek, which is fine. Uh, it drew two successes on Rockdiv, so you get a momentum, but that is a complication. Uh, let's resolve it this way. So Tolek... Uh, when you run your scan, you're seeing that the power for not only this casket, but for the facility itself, are great geothermal power plants that are feeding from the planet's heated core. Um, it, there's a lot of power here, but definitely not on, this, on the magnitude that a warp core would produce. Um, as for Idru... When you go to scan Rockdiv, you are able to get a brief reading of his gene sequence. But just as you're starting to, you know, tap the, the, the tricorder and get it to process it, what happens is the tricorder suddenly short circuits 
and goes completely dead. Well, that was unexpected. Mr. Uh, Rocktiff, is that normal? I couldn't say. This is the first time I'm seeing such a device. Commander, Commander Tullet, could you take a look at this? Maybe determine what happened to uh, the doctor's tricorder? Sure, I'll troubleshoot the tricorder. All right. Uh, roll me a, I'll, I'll... Uh, let's do a reason engineering difficulty of one. Would this count as emergency repairs? Yeah, not quite yet. All right. Hey, you get the one you need. The good news is that Idru's uh, tricorder, it wasn't like attacked or anything. It just simply shorted out because of how cold it is. So if you were to just replace the power pack and rewire a few things, it'll work just fine again. Then I'll go ahead and do that and hand it back over. That should work for a little bit, bit longer. Don't take too long on the scale. Thank you, Commander. I will investigate uh, Oran for or Oran next. Oran, right? Or is it Oram? You got it. Cool. And yeah, that would be another uh, insight medicine, this time difficulty of two. So could I, in the time that it took to elect to repair the tricord, have used my mental repository to collect what I saw from uh, the first scan to start forming a hypothesis? Yeah, I would say that's fair. Okay, so that means it's a difficulty of one. Very nice, you get a point of momentum. And I get a free obtain information too from that uh, mental repository. Okay. Well, let me tell you what you get first and then you can ask that question. Cool. So what you are detecting is that yes, there is uh, what is essentially a, and you're the doctor here, so feel free to correct me if I'm mixing up terms. Um, there is a RNA virus in their system that is actively rewriting their genetic code. Interestingly, Rocktiv doesn't seem to be affected by it, meaning he's just asymptomatic or is otherwise immune to the changes. For his wife, on the other hand, it is almost like a degenerative autoimmune disease where the body is literally attacking itself as it is changed. You guys think of any questions? Is this purely a evolutionary thing? Yeah, that's a good one. Or is it caused by some external, like, is it caused by maybe a disease or a bacteria or virus that attacks the system and changes it? Or... What about Rocktiv? Has he been genetically modified in some way, or is there some sort of external factor that has rendered him immune to it? Well, which of the two questions do you want? Let's start with the first one, Shran's question about is it an external or just evolutionary factor? Then I think we can go from there and figure out what's going on with Rocktiv. Yes, it is engineer it is evolutionary. But to evolve into something like this, it had to have been engineered, i.e. it had to have been coaxed or driven towards this sort of conclusion. Mr. Rective, from what I see here, it does appear as there or perhaps some external factors in play. Again, do you have any information that might lead me to understand how your species evolved in this way? What's your presence medicine like? That's a 13 total, five medicine, eight presence. 
I'd like you to roll me a uh, Presence Medicine. I'm going to spend some Threat here. Difficulty of four. Yeah, pretty bad odds here. Uh, let's see. Focus in... Surgery? Um... Yeah, I could see an argument for it. Because that means I need this. I would need to spend our three momentum to even have a chance for uh, for rolling four dice here. You guys okay with that? Do it. Don't forget determination, though. I kind of think I might need determination to try to treat them, though. Heck yeah. Let's just go for it. Let's go for all the beans. I'll say uh, life is life, whether it's wrapped in skin, scales, or feathers. Mm-hmm. So are you spending or not spending? I think he's spending two for one. Yeah, two for an extra dice. So we still have one. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> well, sorry, guys. Hmm. I mean, the captain is, is here. Cool. The captain could point at you and give you his determination. Mm. I think Would the failure should be interesting. To... I, uh... I was going to say, I think the failure could be interesting for Idru because I'm, I'm kind of being really pushy here. Mm -hmm. Well, let would I still believe that the primary mission of Starfleet... I, I assume I have to burn a value to do that? No, that is actually just your captain abilities. You can point at someone you can contact, like you are within communication with, and just give them a point of determination from your pool. Oh, well, then I'll do that. Um, and then I will roll to see if I get that determination back. Mm -hmm. Just one challenge die... Which you get it right back. Again, the power of okay. a captain or an XO that uh, has veteran. Then I will use that determination to re-roll those two dice. All right. Hey. Very nice. I believe that is, what, a total of five, four successes? I believe it's six. Because I used my determination for two. Ah, you're right. So that is indeed six successes, which means you get two momentum back. So, Idru, you, of course, ask Rockdiv this question. And he does hesitate for a little bit. And finally, his shoulders slump a little bit, and he says, I was the one who engineered it. Do you mean engineered for your wife or for your species? You have to understand I was a very angry man a long time ago. I felt that society had cast me out, had cast my wife out. I did many things I'm not proud of. But in the process, I did something that no one should ever be able to atone for. I killed my species. Well, Mr. Rective, it's not my place to judge your past actions. That will be for a different group of people. My primary concern here is treating your wife. I think having to live with that knowledge for, what, what did you say, 500 years? A long time. That's, that's enough. We can't undo that, but maybe we can undo this one small part of it. I would also like to point out, Captain, that the Federation has no jurisdiction in this matter, and the dictates of the Prime Directive would be clear. Mr. Uh, Rockdiv, what what was your goal? Were you trying to 
play with genetic modification to make your species stronger, or...? I was a geneticist, yes, I was... More or less tampering to see what could be done in the name of science, and... To put it bluntly, uh... My boss at the time decided that my research was suddenly not wor worth the funding anymore. I got angry. There was an accident. The plague got out. Are you yourself immune to it, however? I am. And believe me, I wish I could tell you why. But honestly, I think it is penance for what I have done that I am cursed to live forever and live with that burden. Do you know if this can, this modification can jump species? I'm unsure. We've never had alien visitors such as yourselves for a prolonged period of time. At least not since, well... And he started his trails off. Mr. Rocktiff. Sorry. Uh. Forgive me, Captain, but uh, Mr. Rocktiff, I want you to know that I'm not here to judge you or to place blame on you or anyone else. My primary concern is with treating your wife. So every piece of information that you withhold and do not share makes it more difficult for me to do my job. If you would truly like for her to recover, the best thing you can do is tell us everything you know. Do you have data storage units of some kind? I believe we have those in abundance. I will need one of them. I will transfer everything that I have. I'll hand him my, uh, my tricorder. Uh, I think that would be... He'd be able to do that. Okay. With that. So I he... do, though, secretly uh, signal to Saval to keep an eye, a closer, because he's already keeping an eye, a closer eye on him just to make sure he's not going to attempt anything. Okay. So Rocktiv takes the tricorder, uh, takes it over to one of the consoles next to the casket that has his wife in it, uh, literally plugs in a wire... And sort of watches the screens as the data is transferred. And once it's done, he unplugs it, brings it back, hands it to Idru and says, That is everything. I'll start studying. And I will not really pay too much interest in how all of this happened, apart from how that medically would be um, a factor in treating his wife. Mm-hmm. Yeah, roll me a, uh, let's call this an insight medicine. Uh, difficulty of four. And you would Does have a focus by? here. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I'd have to take our momentum again because there's no other way for me to get close. You want all three? That's two extra dice. I'd be rolling four dice. It's, it's the best chance we'd have. Well, you could always give me more threat for that fifth die. I feel like you have a lot of threat. You're testing us. And I feel like there's <laughs> one thing after this that we have to consider that could be uh, very uh, important. Yes, oh yes. How many 20s have I rolled tonight? So a many. lot. We've seen a lot of 20s tonight. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, but that is four successes. So, Idru... Uh, you are able to figure out that, yeah, actually, since he's given you everything, you are already figuring out how you might go about, like, reversing the effects of this disease, like, almost forming a, uh, a counter virus that would prevent the virus from continually modifying the, the RNA. The problem, the complication, is that... Let's say, for example, you used this procedure on his wife, and his wife made a full recovery. If Roctiv ever comes in contact with the cure, it will kill him. Meaning he cannot even touch his wife. I 
I don't think Idru would even share that. Yeah, I don't think Idru would even share that. Idru would immediately start working on the the curing process. Okay. Um. I uh, before just before you start doing that, I have. I think I pull you. I pull everyone aside just a few steps away from from uh, Victor, and I I say, um, Doctor. Based on what you're seeing, is there any way that this research could be used and be turned into a weapon? Yes, Captain. In fact, that's really how it originated. Yeah, it already sounds all, like a weapon. All of this information is on a beeline to Dominion Control. We can't let this information continue to exist. However, Captain, until we understand the nature of this virus, we don't know that it could actually transmit to another species. And DNA manipulation, creation of a virus, isn't advanced science. I would imagine that the Dominion, based on what we know about them, possess the ability to create this sort of thing already. But this could be something that they haven't thought of or something even more devastating than what they've worked on. We can't let them, just even for the slim chance that, that it could be used that way, we can't let that happen. I think the captain is absolutely right, Doctor. Think of all the many millions of people who could die if this virus was appropriated by the Dominion. Don't lose sight of the needs of the many because of the needs of the one. Uh, thank you, Mr. Saval, for the conjecture. However, in front of me, I have a patient that needs my attention immediately. Uh, the future hasn't happened yet. Uh, bear with me, Captain. Uh, yes, to... we, can, we can still help. I, know, I didn't mean that. Um... The only place this virus currently exists is in his wife. There's nothing to say that she has to stay on this planet or that the both of them can't be relocated. And it exists on the consoles that he has here. And Which possibly can... in other places on this planet. I mean, we could always destroy all of this machinery and the data. If I may, provided that we can provide a cure for this disease in the near future, uh, he may be willing to actually assist us in the eradication of his data. I'm certain that if we explain the situation with the Dominion and the danger into which he and his wife are entering, he would be amenable to our assistance. The Dominion would kill him and take his research, dooming his wife. And I'm actually going to spend eight threat here to immediately end the scene because what happens is, Captain Shran, you get a call on your communicator from Holton back on the I-13. And she says, Captain, I have three Jem'Hadar attack craft coming on an approach course for the I-13 in the planet. They will be here in approximately one hour. Doctor, how long would it take you? to cure Rockta's wife. ELH, what do you think? I think it would be a very difficult extended task. It would be a timed extended task. It's possible, but difficult is what I would say. We do also we have no momentum, so... Yeah. Do we know if um, her stasis pod, is it transportable? Now, that is a question for Mr. Tolek. Uh, so, Tolek, why don't you roll me a Insight Engineering uh, difficulty of one? All right, you get a momentum. If you're careful about it, Tolek, and you were to use the cargo transporters, you could conceivably get the cryopod and all of the surrounding equipment that sustains it up to the I-13 in the cargo bay. 
Uh, you would just have to have either yourself or someone from your engineering team ready to plug it into an EPS conduit. So it's technically possible. It's going to be very difficult, and I might need to go up first so that I can ensure that there is no loss of power right after it te transports. Teleports. Commander Holton, do you have a lock on our transporter signals? I do, sir, yes. Stand by. Um, I have to go talk to Rocktiv. All right. And uh, I explain the situation. Um, if we had enough time, I'm very confident that we could cure your wife and you two would be able to stay here. And... But unfortunately, um, there are three ships on an intercept course to this planet that belong to our uh, belong to the Dominion, who we are currently at war with. And they, I'm afraid that if they got their hands on this information, they could turn this plague into a biological weapon. Um, so, Mr. Rocktiv, I can't let your information exist when the Dominion get here. But we have come up with a solution, and that would be you and your wife coming to our ship. My engineer, Commander Tolek, believe she can successfully bring your wife's pod onto our ship and from there we can get out of here and cure your wife I'd like you to roll me a presence command difficulty of four and if you have persuasion that would definitely apply presence command um, I will, I'll use my, uh, value because I know, uh, I know that if I can't convince them of this, I, we still have to destroy the information. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping he'll say yes. I still believe that the mission of Starfleet is a peaceful one mm -hmm. and that's what I'm hoping happens here. A peaceful resolution. So that's my determination. Okay. And I will use momentum to buy an extra die. Uh, it would be one momentum, one threat. I'll I'll do that. Okay. So I'm rolling three. Correct. And it's presence command. Mm-hmm. With a focus, and I already have two successes. Correct. Another six, so you get two momentum right back. Yeah, Rocktiv just sort of stares at you impassively. Then he relaxes a little bit and says, Very well. Uh, I will set the self-destruct of this place. Uh, how long do you need? Um, the Dominion ships will be here in an hour. Uh, so if we can be out of here in 45 minutes, that gives us enough time to get away safely without a threat of a confrontation. Very good. And he goes over to a console and begins to work. Uh, Telek, though, up oh, one second. I do pause and tell him the only things that need to be destroyed is the information that for this genetic modification. The history of your people should be saved, if possible. He doesn't say anything, but he does make a motion with his head that he heard you. Um, but as far as Telek is concerned, so there's two ways to go about this, Telek. Uh, you can either do an extended task to basically get the transporter ready 
get the people on the other end ready to plug it in. Or you can do a single task. It would just be at a higher difficulty. You can do the extended task. The extended task? Okay. So uh, the extended task is going to work like this, and I will type it out. So it's going to have a work track of 12, a magnitude of 4, a base difficulty of 4. Uh, there would not be... Would there be resistance? I suppose there would be at least one resistance. And then important is you have only uh, two... inter, Or you have... Four intervals, and each attempt, unless you give me a point of momentum before you roll, each attempt is two intervals, unless you give me the momentum to make it one interval. And if you run out of intervals, the Dominion show up. Could we um, beam down uh, another member of the engineering team to assist Telek? Uh, I would say if we have a supporting character that would apply here, go for it. We already have the uh, transporter chief created. Then Does yeah. that make sense? I would say, uh, I'm trying to look at, find him in the, uh, the list here. Martinez. Oh yeah, Martinez. Uh, yeah, if someone wants to do uh, an assist on Telek with uh, Martinez, you certainly can do so. Uh, I, I can. Okay. So, Talek, uh, you're going to be rolling a control and an engineering here. And would I have any applicable focuses for this? I actually don't know this time. I'm not just asking, so I roll really well. I mean, let's take a look. <laughs> Uh, I would say, yes, you would. You have improvisation. That would work. All right, there's three. And what can I roll as the assist? Uh, another control engineering. And would transporters and replicators work as a focus? Oh, most definitely. All right. So... Unfortunately, there isn't a way to get a success here. Unless you have no, because you would have had to spend determination before the roll. Yep. And you can't do determination on Martinez because he doesn't have a value and he's assisting. Can we still spend a momentum to lower it to one interval, even though we didn't succeed? Yeah, I would say you still could lower it down to one interval, but you would now would be at three intervals remaining. Yeah, I mean, so that it's means better you, than two intervals remaining. You have to get at least two breakthroughs in one of your next three rolls, and that's assuming we're spending momentum to make it. I mean, if I can get one breakthrough and I roll on effect, I got a second breakthrough. Yeah. But it's a matter of if I make it there. Mm -hmm. For the next roll, do you have determination to tap? Um, hmm. I, yeah, I could, I could tap. A determination. Thank you for the techno babble. Um, I will tap. <laughs> machines are easier to understand than people. Okay. And that's the control engineering. Yep, same rolls as before. Uh, Commander, uh, if I uh, if I modify the trifold neutrino display displacement grid, uh, that should let the I thirteen get a, a solid lock on the on this pod. Is that Martinez talking? Yes. Yes. Then I agree with Martinez. All righty. Let's hope your rolls are a little bit better this time around. All right. That is five successes already. Martinez, help me out. Six successes, which is uh, two momentum. So yeah, Telek, I need you to roll me seven challenge dice, please. All right, so that is a grand total of eight work done, which is a breakthrough. You have Miracle Worker, so that's actually two breakthroughs. 
Are you going to spend any of your momentum to decrease the interval? Yes. Okay. So if I have everything right, that is where you stand. A work track of four remaining, a magnitude of two, and a difficulty of two. And you have two intervals remaining. And I figure if we just roll one more time, maybe that'll do that, maybe it won't. I would probably buy two extra dice with uh, two momentum and a threat. Rather than just spend the one and have two intervals to do. It's up to you, of course. Let's just go ahead and get the extra dice. Okay. Four successes. Oh, Very you. nice. Then five successes overall, which means you get a grand total of three momentum back. All right. So all Telek needs to do now is roll at least uh, six on his challenge die. And with one effect. And remind me how many? Uh, seven for Telek. Do we need at least five to make it 12? Uh, no, you're right. Because you need four work to complete the work track. So actually you would have to spend at least one momentum to either reroll those zeros or just go for the sure thing of plus one. Because then you would have enough and this this extended task would be over. So we have three momentum now. If we spent two on that and uh, one to reduce the interval, would that finish it off? Yeah, that should work. So yeah. With uh, Martinez and Telec working together, you guys are able to transport... Uh, the wife of Rocktiv up to the I-13. And not a moment too soon, because with only 15 minutes to spare, you now have to, as part of the away team, get yourselves and Rocktiv back up to the I-13 in the Wave Rider. Can the I-13 do a site-to-site -site transport and beam us back into uh, the bridge there? Uh, the bridge of the Wave Rider or the bridge of the I-13? Uh, the Wave Rider. The Wave Rider. Yeah, uh, if you wanted to sight to sight, that is something that could happen. So we, because how long would it take us to get back up the staircase to the, uh, the Wave Rider? Probably like a good five minutes. So a good thing to, to cut that off. All right. So you all rematerialize in the Wave Rider. Uh, Rocktiv is a little cramped in the back, but he makes do. Uh, Captain, are you still piloting this one? Captain, if I may, I, I must insist. Are you a better pilot than, than Tron? Yes. Then go I've, for it. I have a focus in helm operations and augmented ability uh, control. So. Well, the augmented control isn't going to help you here because it's going to be a daring con. And I have what? two threat remaining, so it's now a difficulty of three. I'm a, I'm, I'm a 13 with Helm Operations as a focus. All right, go for it. I'm better than you. <laughs> yep. So, Ball, you could probably assist. This is true. You could assist the ball. All right, then I'll, I'll feed him uh, Helm coordinates and uh, uh, the like regarding the atmospheric conditions to try to make his navigation easier. Right. Oh, can I roll? I didn't roll to see if I get my um, determination back. I would, yeah, that could be very important. So definitely do that. Nope. Nope. All right. Well, it's going to be a, uh, for whoever's actually flying, it's going to be a daring con. Uh, Whoever's assisting is going to be doing a insight or control plus con. Overall difficulty is a three. K 
can I buy it's is it two threat or one threat to buy an extra die? Uh it is the same cost as momentum. So for the third die it so would be one, one momentum. Or one threat, yeah. I will do that. Okay. And you said uh control con or inside con? Correct. Well, there's two successes already. Oh, and does the Wave Rider get to roll? It would, yes, with an Engines Con. And I believe the Wave Rider has to get a success here. Or it's game over, character's dead. Well, not quite, but... I have it in front of me, so I'll roll it. All right. So, what's going to happen is you have one of two options here. You can either get back to the I-13 and cause another structural breach, but you'll be back at the I-13. Or we move into pseudo-starship combat where the Dominion might get an attack or two on the Wave Rider. So it's really up to you whether you want to see if you're lucky enough to avoid Jem'Hadar attack fighters or if you just want to, you know, hit the ship and get the hell out of dodge. Question, though. We already have two breaches to structure, do we not? That is correct. We do. So what would that actually entail, then, if we've matched our, our scale in breaches? So I'm going to pull up the rules so I don't say this the wrong thing here. But uh, I believe that technically means that the... Uh, structure, where is it? Da, 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 da. Uh, structure, if the total number of breaches the structure system has suffered is equal to the scale of the ship, which it would be, then the system has been disabled. This vessel has suffered many fires and serious hull breaches, as well as sections losing life support. The extreme disarray of the ship makes it extremely difficult to report, rep ah, to perform repairs Increasing the complication range of all engineering tasks and the difficulty of all engineering tasks. It also reduces your resistance in half, rounding down. Uh, but you still can fly. You still can warp. Uh, it is not destroyed. It is only disabled. So basically the way we land is we crash the Bodhi through the I-13. <laughs> Pretty much, get yeah. All the crash. Star Trek Five. We're not going to survive two rounds of pseudo combat with Jemadar fighters. Let's do it. All right. So yeah, pretty pretty cinematically, what happens is the wave rider, <laughs> okay. the uh, the wave rider gets on an approach course, and uh, Holton chimes in and says, "Sir, you're you're coming in awfully fast." Prepare for a uh, a rough landing, everybody. Oh, I'm dear. not looking. And quite literally, you slam back up into the Wave Rider's docking bay with such force that there's just a unholy screech of metal on metal and a severe jolt as even the I-13 itself buckles a little bit and kind of rears back, if you will. Um, but your helm officer is able to compensate very quickly, uh, restore the warp bubble around the I-13, and right as Jem'Hadar attack craft come across the screen, their weapons charged. The I-13 goes to warp. The Jem'Hadar weapons fire and hit nothing. And then as they begin to circle back around to the planet, there's an explosion uh, as the facility on the planet detonates. So yeah, you guys have uh, made it through once again. Of course, now you have to deal with Rockdiv and his wife, but, uh, you know, you'll take victories when you can get them. Um, I think as soon as I get to the bridge, I, I set a direct, I, yeah, we set a direct course for the nearest, uh, space station. Because we've taken some serious damage. Alrighty. We're likely out of action for a little bit. And, uh, um, and Centauri would just turn back to the captain when he hears that order. Uh, so, Captain, are you sure you don't want to do the flying? I mean, sounds like you're the guy who knows all about piloting starships. Um, it's Ensign, a... I, I believe I did a great job. 
terrific job. Fantastic job. <laughs> it's huge. Huge. <laughs> okay. Right on. Great show, Cap. Like, you have to admit, it looked cool, right? You've always wanted to try that maneuver, haven't you, Ensign? Yes. It's, it's really more just jealousy, sir. Well, maybe next time you'll be the one piloting it. I do have to explain all this damage to uh, to the Admiral. So, uh, yeah. Uh, steady course to the nearest starbase, sir. Thank you, Ensign. All right. Sorry, Captain, to put a freeze on this moment, but I think I'm going to go check on our guests and perhaps any casualties from the uh, Shrine maneuver. Yes, um... What is the, the the status report of the ship? And Holton speaks up and says, well, aside from the fact that Deck 5 is completely unusable, uh, everything's great. Oh, and we're probably going to have to dislodge the Wave Rider at some point, but details. We'll get another one. See, you don't have to deal with those details. I have to deal with those details. And that's why you're a commander. And that's why I'm a captain. I get to delegate. Yes, sir, you do. <laughs> and I tell you what, we are coming up on the time when people have to start going. So why don't we end the session there and we'll handle the fate of Rocktiv and his wife sort of in the interim during one of our starting mission logs. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, let me kill the stream. So thank you so much for watching. If you have, uh, these guys will be back in two weeks, but until then, uh, see you later stream. Bye-bye.